Well, I'll give you a warm welcome to our worship service this last Sunday of November. And we're going to enter into a time of praise once we've read from Psalm 135, just the first few verses. Psalm 135. Praise the name of the Lord. Give praise, O servants of the Lord, who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing to his name, for it is pleasant. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel as his own possession. For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. We're going to have a, a series of songs here, singing and starting with When I Feel the Touch of Your Hand Upon My Life, moving into when I look into your holiness and then into we really want to thank you Lord
going to hear from God's word in a moment. Before we do that, let's just pray to the Lord. Father in heaven, we, we thank you that we are your people. We are your possession. Uh, Lord, we just thank you that we can also say, Lord, Abba, Father, we are sons and daughters of the Most High, and we're able to say that you are our Heavenly Father. We just worship you uh, this morning, Lord, and just pray, Father, that you receive all the, the, the glory and the honour uh, from your people as we just exalt your name uh, this Lord's day. And Father, we just Thank you for the, 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 the fingerprints, the, the, the touch of God uh, in our lives. And we just, just really want to thank you that you are interested in every aspect of our lives and, and keen to, to lead us into new things. And so, Lord, we just uh, really uh, ask that you'd help us in our weakness and that by your grace you just lead us and strengthen us and show us the way. And, Father, we just thank you that although you are holy, uh, we are able to have communion and fellowship with the true and living God because our sin has been dealt with. We don't fear when we come into your presence because of what your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, has done for us. And we, we, we really thank you, Lord, as we've been singing there. We really want to bless your name and, and just give you all the glory because, yes, praise the Lord, yes, hallelujah, Jesus is our King. And so, Lord, we just uh, turn our attention to your word. And as Rod comes uh, later to uh, expound from it, we just pray that we would just uh, be open to your speaking, open to the Holy Spirit, taking uh, the word and really planting it in our hearts and so that we can live uh, for you aright. And so, Lord, we just commit that to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, this is the reading, 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 through to 21. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. But he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding, so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Well, thanks again to Mark and Tina, as, as always, they're uh, leading us in worship. And I hope this morning that your hearts are lifted and that you have the confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ in every aspect of your life. As we come together this morning, as we conclude uh, the, the final passage in first john we have been looking at the real life the life that is real and what is your relationship with jesus like today we're going to be looking at are you walking in confidence now we've, we've taken the theme of walking because it's really talking about our journey in our spiritual life with the lord jesus christ how close are you walking with Jesus? Are you following him? Do you know him? Have you experienced him by faith? And that's really been the theme throughout the letter. And I guess those are raising questions. Are we walking in 
the light? Are we bringing our sin into the light so that it has no dominion over us? Are we walking in the abiding of Christ? And do we know the Holy Spirit working within our lives, bring us in, in, bringing us into all truth and teaching us from the Word of God? Are we walking rightly before God? Are we keeping to the narrow path? Uh, are we walking as Christ walked? And are we walking in love? And this morning we're going to be looking at, are you walking in confidence? Well, I was thinking of uh, a missionary couple and their family who were home on furlough. They were spending their holiday in a lodge near a lake. And they had three children, aged 12, 7 and 4. And one day the four-year-old slipped away from his brother and sister and he went down onto the pier at the lake to play. Well, it wasn't long before he'd fallen in to the lake. He didn't know how to swim and he wasn't wearing a life jacket. And the screams of the two older children alerted dad to the danger. And he ran down to the pier and the kids pointed to where their brother had fallen in. The dad dived into the lake and he went all the way to the bottom and he felt around frantically looking for his little boy. Finally, he ran out of air and he came to the surface, took another deep gulp and then went down again, searching for his son. And this time he felt the little boy's leg and, and he found his four-year-old son with his arms and his legs wrapped tightly around one of the pilings to the pier. He was about three feet below the water. The father pried him loose and carried him to the surface, took him onto the lawn. And as they both caught their breath, they were able to calm down and restore something to normality. And then the father asked, son, what were you doing down there, hanging on to that piling? And the little boy said, I was confident that my daddy would rescue me. I was confident that you would rescue me. Are you walking in confidence? today? Are you confident in your Father in heaven? Are you confident in the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you confident in your salvation? Do you really believe? Well, Paul, John writes these, uh, this letter and he says in this letter, I write these things to you who believe. He's writing to the believers in the church. And he's writing that you may know that you have eternal life. His hope is to persuade us to walk in confidence, knowing our eternal life is with Jesus in the kingdom to come. And this is what he wrote in his gospel in John chapter 20, verse 30. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. He wants us to know that we have eternal life, so we can have the assurance and so that you may continue to believe. The, the need to hear the simple gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ doesn't end once we're saved. We benefit by it, we're assured by it, and we're helped to continue in it as we hear it and embrace it over and over again. You see, John's confidence is impressive. We can only know this if our salvation rests in Jesus and not in our own efforts. If it depends on me, then I can lose my salvation. 
But if it depends on what Jesus has done for me, then I can never lose my salvation. Because it's all in what he did and not what I do. And so the first point is confidence in prayer, knowing God's will. In verses 14 and 15 it says, This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked him of him. John is developing the idea of confidence in God. For now, those who know they have eternal life, John is saying we can have the confidence in prayer. If you know you're eternal with God, then you can have confidence in prayer. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. In this we see the purpose of prayer and we also see the secret power in prayer. First, God is waiting for us to ask in prayer. You see, much prayer fails because we never ask for anything. God is a loving God and, and a generous giver and he's waiting, desperate for us to ask of him. Are you bringing everything before God? Are you being honest with God? Are you open with Him? He's waiting for you to ask Him. Secondly, God wants us to ask Him anything in prayer. Not that anything we ask will be granted, but anything in the sense that we can and should pray about everything. God cares about our whole life and nothing is too small or too big to pray about. Thirdly, God wants us to ask according to his will. It's easy for us to only be concerned about our will before God and have a disregard for his will. We have an attitude that says he will accomplish his will with or without my prayers anyway, won't he? But God wants us to see and discern his will through his word and to pray his will into action. In John 15 verse 7 it says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. When we abide in Jesus, when we live and walk as Jesus walked, living in him day by day, then our will becomes more and more aligned with his will. And we can ask according to his desire. And more and more we will be asking according to his will. It's then that we see answered prayer. It's the principle of more and more. We see that in John's Gospel. If we love him, obey my commandments. If you love me, obey my commandments. If we obey his commandments, he reveals more of himself. As we love him, we obey him and he reveals more of himself. It's the principle of more and more. The more we obey him, the more he reveals, the more we love. It's the principle of more and more. Why would God wait to accomplish his will until we pray. Because God has appointed us to work with him. As workers together with him, God wants us to work with him and that means bringing our will and agenda into a line with his. He wants us to care about the things he cares about and he wants us to care about them enough to pray passionately about them. When we ask according to God's will, when we pray the promises of God, we have this confidence. And so we can pray with real and definite faith. How passionate is your prayer life? Do you pray believing? Do you pray knowing the promises of God? 
And do you pray believing that God will answer your prayers? Prayer should be so much more than just casting your wishes to heaven. It's, it's rooted in understanding God's will and promises according to his word. And it's praying for those promises to come into action. For each prayer request we should mentally or vocally ask, what possible reason do I have to think that God will answer this prayer? What possible reason do I have to, to think that God will answer this prayer? And we should be able to answer that question from his word. You see, God is delighted when we pray his promises. It shows our will is aligned to his will. Our dependence is upon him and not ourselves. And that we are taking his word seriously. We could say that that little boy. I was confident that my daddy would rescue me. I was confident that God would answer my prayer. I am confident in God's love for me that he will rescue me. That's the whole issue here in our confidence. Our confidence is not in us, but in God who first loved us. That little boy knew his father loved him and he knew he would do all in his power to come and rescue him. What's our confidence like in God? Do we trust him? Do we believe that he's faithful to his promises? Do we believe that he's ever with us? That he'll never leave us nor forsake us? And this confidence uh, in prayer goes for the prayer for a sinning brother. In verses 16 and 17. If you see any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray and God will give them life. If you refer to those whose sin does not lead to death, there is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying that you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin and therefore sin that does not lead to death. It's a complicated passage. But when we see a brother in sin, John tells us the first thing to do is to pray for that person. Or too often we ignore it and we never confront him. Not that we should be running around uh, pointing out every person's sin, but we should be loving enough to broach it with them. We should love them enough to bring it to their attention, but we're not condemning them. We're not judging them. We're wanting to help them. Surely, if we love each other, the best thing would be to pray for each other. John here isn't speaking of a sin that leads to loss of salvation, but rather a carnal life, or even the possibility of physical death of a believer. This is a difficult concept, but we have an example of it in 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul says, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. This death came not as a condemning judgment, but as a corrective judgment. And it's a very sobering thought to think God would call you home because you are of no earthly use. You have been given a new life in Christ Jesus. You've been regenerated into a new humanity. But if you've allowed sin to become part of your life and you've chosen to live in the world, then you're at danger of God saying, giving you up to that sin. Not that you've lost your salvation, but he's giving you over to that life. You've chosen that life where he gave you a new life and you've rejected it. 
it's possible that we can sin to the point where God believes it's just best thing to bring us home. You've continued so long, but it's time to come home. Because you're now of no earthly use. John takes pains to recognise that not every sin leads to death in the manner that he's speaking of, although all unrighteousness is sin. If you confess your sins one to another, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's about walking in the light. It's not allowing the darkness to hide our sin away that can destroy us and take us to, into carnality, to live as the world would live, to live a lie. John is saying here, don't do that. And if a brother or sister is doing that, then bring it to their attention. Pray for them. Pray that they would have the spiritual wisdom to repent of the sin and help them. Don't judge them. Confidence in prayer is protecting our relationship with God. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. It's important that we know who our enemy is. In the battle against sin, it's essential that we keep our minds set on who we are in Christ Jesus. We are born of Him. We then have the resource to be freed from habitual sin. He has given us His Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells within us to convict us when we sin against the Holy God. And he gives us a way out of every sin that we're involved in. John here is really rep repeating the idea from 1 John 3, 6. Whoever abides in him does not sin. John is, is speaking of a, a settled, continual lifestyle of sin. It, it's not teaching us that we have the possibility of a sinless perfection. It just means that we are kept by Jesus who protects us from Satan. We always have the opportunity to bring that sin into the light. And when it's in the light, that sin has no longer got power over us. Satan wants to keep it in the darkness. He wants to keep it hidden so that it can do damage to us and to our brothers and sisters. It's interesting, in this passage, he uses the word touch and the, as the idea of one um, is being attached to. John clearly says that the, the wicked one, Satan, or one of his demons, cannot attach himself to the one who is born of God. We cannot be possessed of demonic influences because we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. And so although Satan can have an influence and the demons can have an influence over our lives by tempting us, they can never possess us, for we are sealed and we are his. And just knowing this fact means that we can be free to be what we are and who we are in Christ Jesus. And we can separate ourselves from the world system that rebels against him. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Simply put, John is saying, abide in Jesus and avoid idolatry. In the conclusion to this letter, John returns to his major theme, fellowship with Jesus, the real Jesus, walking the real life, knowing Jesus, 
uh, hearing Jesus, seeing Jesus, touching Jesus. We must know him and this speaks of a knowledge by experience. Not an intellectual knowledge, but a knowledge by experience. This understanding must be given. We cannot attain it of our own. If God did not reveal himself to us, we would never find him. We know him and can know him because he has revealed himself to us. Jesus is the key to the focus of it all. We see the personality and character of God by looking at Jesus. If your God does not look like Jesus, he's not the God of the Bible. He's not the one and only true living God. A lot of people say they believe in God, but they don't believe in Jesus. Well, that's wrong. That's not the God of the universe. We see God through Jesus, by looking at Jesus. He who is true. It also reminds us of the theme John has and has had through the letter. The importance of true belief. Of trusting the true Jesus. Not the made up Jesus. The Jesus of the Bible. Him who is true. The true Jesus was a, a man. But he was not only a man. John does not and we cannot promote the humanity of Jesus over his deity. Or his deity over humanity. He is both fully God and fully man. And then he goes on to say, keep yourselves from idols. This may seem a very strange way to end John's letter, but it fits in with the theme of a real living relationship with God. The enemy to fellowship with God is idolatry. Embracing a false God. Or a false idea of the true God. And, and John rightly closes with this warning. After spending much of his letter warning us against the dangers of a false Jesus. A false Jesus that many were teaching in his day. We can only have a real relationship with God, with a God who is really there. Idolatry, whether obvious, praying to statues, or subtle, living for your career or someone other than God, will always choke out a real relationship with God and damage our relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. No wonder John ends this letter with keep yourselves from idols. It is so important and it's so intrusive and, 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 it's, and it's just around and about. And, and we really need to think carefully if we're putting something before God, whether it's a relationship, uh, whether, whether it's uh, materialism, whether it's our, our finances, whether it's um, uh, our children, whatever it is, we have to really check and see, are we putting them before, or it, before God? For if we are, then our relationship is wrong with God. So how do we protect our relationship with God? How do we keep ourselves from idolatry? Well, we need to identify where it is first. Well, the obvious, visible idols, material things, cars, homes, relationships, children's partners. What about the worshipping of yourself? We can do this by overindulgence in food and drink, by laziness, or by too much concern about how we look or what we wear. What about the worshipping of wealth? The worshipping of some hobby or pursuit? 
lot of people worship golf. Fishing. These are areas that can quite easily become idolatrous. What about the worshipping of a dear friend or a relative? What are your idols? What are you susceptible to as making into an idol? Are you confident in prayer, knowing God's will? Are you confident in prayer for a sinning brother or sister? Are you confident in your relationship with God? Are we guarding our hearts from idolatry? Well, we need to take a closer look at ourselves and then turn from the things we idolise to turn back to the true living God in Jesus Christ. Are you walking in confidence, knowing him and walking with him in a real way? Let us pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message of 1 John, for all its challenges to us. Help us to be real. We want and desire to walk as you walk, to talk as you talk, to live the life that you've given us through Jesus Christ. Lord, when you plucked us from being dead in our sins, you regenerated us as a new humanity. You gave us a new life. Help us to live that new life that is in Christ Jesus and turn away from the old life that so easily infiltrates us, so easily overtakes us, how weak we are. And yet in Jesus Christ you have given us the victory. And so at any point when we feel we have slipped from you, we can turn back to you and repent, asking for forgiveness for our sins, bringing our sins into the light so that they have no power over us. And Lord, as we die to ourselves, that we would grow that you would grow ever greater in us. Lord, our desire is to be like you, to walk like you and talk like you. Take us now. Help us to reflect on who we are, but more importantly, to know who we are in Christ Jesus. Lord, take us and use us as your servants, that we are the light in this dark world and that light can only shine bright when we draw ever closer to you in jesus name amen, amen. well as we conclude our, our time around his word we'll now finish with a, a song of worship as we lift our voices to you in praise and worship Next week we'll be moving on to second job, walking in truth. And that will be challenging as well. It's been a great time for us to spend time in God's Word this morning. And what a privilege it's been to work through the letter or the sermon that John has given us in 1 John. I hope it's been challenging to you. It certainly has for me. And I hope you grow in faith and in love, knowing the Lord and all that he has done for you, in Jesus' name. Over to you, Mark. Thank you, Rod. We, we will now close the, the service uh, with the, the hymn, What a Wonderful Change in My Life Has Been Wrought Since Jesus Came Into My Heart.
Father in heaven, we can't help but be excited when we, we sing such a song as that, Lord, because it just it stirs up in us these wonderful truths um, about what's happened to us since Jesus came into our hearts. And that, that life is not easy. We still have the, the, the ups and downs and the sea billows roll, but the, the difference is that Jesus has come in and has, is reigning in our lives. And so we just bless you, Lord, and give you thanks and praise that you are our King, that you are our Lord, that you are our Saviour. And so, Father, we just praise you and thank you. Pray that you be with us, your church, um, as we move into this new week, Lord, uh, into this time uh, of Advent, looking forward to the, the coming Saviour, remembering the, the, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ as a, a, as a babe, a, 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 as a human being. Um, uh, the, the God became man and dwelt amongst us. And so, Lord, we, we, as we look forward to that, as we celebrate with, with the church, and as we use it as an opportunity to share with people uh, about the, the good news of the gospel, just as that angel proclaimed to the, the, the shepherds on the field looking after their, their flocks uh, at night, that the good news of the gospel, that a saviour uh, was, was here. And we just pray that you'd help us, your church, by your spirit to share the message of the gospel that Jesus is here and that people can be changed and transformed and be changed just as that song said that since Jesus came into my heart there's been a wonderful change and it's miraculous because God is involved. And so Lord we just commit our, uh, the week to you now praying you be with us in Jesus name. Amen.